Welcome to the 2019 ACLS webinar series. The Association of Consultants for Liturgical Space is a voluntary membership organization of professionals dedicated to the creation of beautiful worship spaces for faith communities. This webinar series is part of our ongoing dedication to providing mutual professional support and continuing education for our members. I'm Paul Barable of Growth Design Group. I am the webinar facilitator for the ACLS webinar committee, and it is my pleasure to facilitate today's webinar. Today's speaker is Juanita Yoder. For 30 years, artist Juanita Yoder has painted large scale installations on silk for spiritual, corporate, academic, healthcare, hospitality, and residential settings. She works closely with clients to envision site-specific artwork. Her commissions include such notable institutions as Princeton University Chapel, St. Mary's College, Notre Dame, as well as Central Park Hotel in Romania. She was awarded a Bene Award for devotional art for a commission of the 15 Stations of the Cross for St. Thomas More Catholic Church in Glendale, Arizona. Her designs are also available in architectural glass, oil on linen, acrylic on canvas, and kinetic processional pieces. Juanita is formally trained as a painter with a BA in art from Goshen College, Indiana, and an MA from Eastern Illinois University, where she was awarded a full scholarship and teaching assistantship. She is a former board member of the ACLS, and most of us know Juanita very well. Welcome to the webinar, uh, as a presenter, Juanita. Thank you, Paul. Um, my presentation has three parts. The first third will be on the setting up and creating a commission. The second third will be about installation of those commissions and some details around that. And the third part can be seen as a possible mini story of the creative process. And I'm going to start with a, a short video. I began <clears throat> as a watercolor realist and discovered painting on silk as the possibility of getting painting out of the frame, off the wall, and moving in space. And I saw the potential for creating an atmosphere, um, a liturgical season, and expressing an internal spiritual language. Commissions often start with a site visit. This is New Brunswick Theological Seminary, my most recent commission. Uh, and I look and uh, at the space and talk with members of committees. This one, uh, this is an initial imagining moment uh, with Dr. Micah McCreary, the president of the uh, seminary. And there were also three other committee members, including Andrew Weimer, uh, who's head of the chapel and worship. So we had some fun uh, dreaming up ideas and talking about how is the space used? The back wall they use as a projection screen. So we had to keep that in mind. So I also took some watercolor uh, studies from the space on the right. Uh, they also wanted a little tassel. So that's just kind of a little sketch of what we might use to delineate the seasons. This is the seminary logo, uh, some colors that they use, and paint chips that were collected. Uh, so once we agree on a concept, uh, after receiving a 10% non-refundable deposit, I start to create color designs uh, for the specific spaces. And I ask, you know, what uh, of our conversation can be incorporated into this design. What kind of listening needs to happen here? And this is a prayerful time of listening with my mind and my heart and my brushes. 
So this synthesizing process, I'm going to say a little bit more later in the last third of the talk. And my design table moves around. Sometimes it's on the beach. Uh, so here are some drawings that are the finalized ones for New Brunswick Theological Seminary. As you can see, the left and right ones, I'm not sure if you can see, are actually taped on. So they're like several generations in. So there are often several takes until I get to the right uh, image that settles in. I love to work with watercolor and pastel. The watercolor offers a flow uh, and immediacy and the pastel I really like for the groundedness of the mark making. Once I have the uh, drawings finalized, I use Photoshop to create my proposal. I cut out the images once scanned in and create this image along with a statement. And copies of this can be used for fundraising if needed. This is another part of my proposal. I include a simulated installation view. And here you can see where the screen will be at the front of the chapel there. So then uh, the next step, after a 50% deposit is made, I start the painting process. And this is where it starts. My dye cabinet, uh, my all my notes, my drawings, the proposal, the computer copy, all the notes of, from the watercolor uh, little snippets, all gather around my sink. And I mix my dyes from a chemical base. I use fiber reactive dyes. I've used a number of different kinds. Right now I'm using vinyl sulfon dyes. And uh, I vary the viscosity of the dye in order to paint using something called sodium alginate, which thickens the dye and it can be used on the silk as paint. So the silk that I really prefer and love to use is silk twill, uh, 14 mommy, which is the weight of it. I find the dye flows very nicely on this weight of fabric and also it's very strong. Uh, I staple it onto this uh, end wood piece, which is routed out. <clears throat> the side rail is on the ground. I'll show you in the next slide what it looks like put together or soon. Uh, once I stretch it, I measure to make sure the stretch is even. And I measure the ends, making sure uh, it's stretched exactly square. So here on the left side, you can see the conduit. I use electric conduit that goes through that routed out section of the board and use a C-clamp to C-clamp the conduit onto the board. This is a little convoluted, but you know it really works. <laughs> and the C-clamp, another one, C-clamps it onto the PVC pipe. So this is stretched very tight. I wet the silk and uh, it's very taut. Uh, at this point, I start to use vine charcoal to sketch the image on the silk, but it's very light. I pretty much just do little points where design elements are going to be, little measurement uh, marks. And then you can see in the back, uh, there are some dye tests. So that it's okay to advance. <laughs> so here we go. So this, um, is the, the painting process. You can see my palette, lower right. This is mixed up dye when it's extremely liquid. Uh, the thicker dye I use on a palette, it looks almost like acryl an acrylic palette or an oil palette. Uh, this is the very liquid one. So as you can see on the drawing, when you look up close, there are measurements, marks, uh, everything is precise because when I do the second side, there are two large center panels it, the design elements need to land the same place. Beneath the stretched painting is another piece of stretched silk, which I, you can't see here, but before I land the color or the brush stroke on the painting, I test it on the scrap. Because once I put it on the silk, it's done. I get one shot, uh, that's it. So I want it to be right. And in order to prepare for this, uh, I spend time when I go into my studio, rather than just 
picking up my brushes and just starting to paint on the silk, I take time. I may light a candle. I center myself mentally, emotionally, spiritually. Um, basically, I see my studio as a sacred space in which the paintings can arise. For the seminary pieces, the centering uh, took on a different, different activity. It seemed important that I stand at the bottom of the pieces and lay my hands on the painting and just stand there for a while and meditate, pray, wait. And I could feel energy in my hands, like my hands were preparing or being prepared in a way to paint. So this piece right here uh, in, the, in the prior slide was very finished, but almost finished, but very vulnerable. Once it's done, I cut it off the frame. This is uh, the St. Mary's project being rolled up. At this point, it's a very, very vulnerable. And at one point, it wasn't on a commission, but I dropped a plastic beaker of water on the floor. It spewed up water all over the piece. Thankfully, it wasn't a commission. But interestingly, I, I learned some uh, new techniques from that. So since it's vulnerable, uh, it's ready for steaming. Once it's rolled up in this pellon, this is uh, polyester. So it's rolled up very tightly and suspended in a chimney pipe and steamed for one hour. It's fiber reactive. So the dye reacts in the protein on, in the silk. It won't react to the polyester. So the polyester keeps it from printing off on itself. Straight from the steamer, it gets plunged into a sink of water with a chemical that keeps it from printing off on itself. And this is when I wear my gloves and protective wear, including uh, a mask that filters organic vapors. And I have an ex exhaust fan, eye protection. And I rinse this until the hot water runs clear. So this is when the painting is the most vulnerable prior to steaming and when it's in the sink. So I'm more relaxed when this process is finished, but it's necessary to, fin to uh, finish the piece. Once I take it out of the sink, I pat it dry with towels and iron it dry. So it's, it then returns the piece to its original hand or softness of the silk. This is the New Brunswick Theological Seminary, two center panels and Easter on the left and Pentecost on the right. So once they're ironed, it's time for me to then do the trimming. These were too big for my tables, so it's on the floor. I take a long uh, measuring tape, make sure the length is correct and the side to side is correct measurement and I allow for the hemming process, which is about three quarters of an inch extra. Now, when I hem it and trim it, in order for the paintings to be exactly square across the top and all the way down the side, in order for them to hang properly and straight, I pull a thin thread of the silk and make a run in the silk so it's square with the weave. My trimming is square with the weave of the silk. And then it goes through a serger it's, you can almost see the little line that's um, pulled in the silk, but if you look at what's coming out the other side of the machine, it's wrapped and rolled. And I was very happy to get my serger. I used to hand hem everything, and it's just so unpractical. <laughs> unpractical. So this uses three different threads to finish the edges. A wonderful tool. Once the edges are finished and surged, uh, I sew a loop at the top. And this is for a rod to go through to suspend the work. <clears throat> and then finally, on the back side of the top loop, I sign them and date them. These are the six seasons that I created for the New Brunswick Theological Seminary. So their final uh, decision was to do six seasonal paintings and then two large center ones.
Uh, this is from a prior project, but this is an example of how my work is then professionally photographed in the studio using uh, the flashes. And a big white piece of paper behind. I've used a local photographer, Pierre Jaborska. He does a really good job. So these are the bottom hems of the seasonal pieces for the seminary project. For these, because of the they were small, they're about one feet one foot wide each. I hand hemmed the very bottom curve. I just really love that finish on those uh, in here. I have some quick studio photos of the seminary paintings, which I'm going to show you now. Ironically, uh, the scaffolding is up today, and Paul Kuhn, who is installing them, is installing <laughs> the seasonal pieces right now. <laughs> and I will go uh, soon and help install the two large panels and make sure the position is correct. Uh, this is the lower portion of one of the pieces for the seminary. Another lower portion of one of the large panels. This is two foot wide and a detail of the Pentecost piece. These are the two large panels uh, that will be hanging on either side of the screen projection area. And they're 13 and a half feet long. If I need to ship the work, I roll it. It's very carefully rolled and packed inside a PVC pipe and fully insured. So this brings us to the center section of my presentation on installation. Uh, these are already, uh, this is a project I did for the seminary previously of a mobile. So all the little uh, strings I measured ahead of time and attached to clips. Each uh, painting has a rod at the top and I attached a little swivel to the top of each one so they turn. This was about uh, three years ago. So using a scaffolding is one way to install a mobile or painting on silk that's going to be kinetic. Um, this is Paul Kuhn, who's suspending the mobiles, he's mobile pieces. He's clipping them to the ring at the top. And it's the same seminary that's installing today. So when I got there to explore the new project, I discovered the mobile had been moved. It was uh, placed around this wall on the other side, and they brought it out into their main atrium. They wanted it to be more visible. So that can be a surprise with installation. <clears throat> this is 8th Street Mennonite Church in Indiana. On the right is Stan Shetler, and he designed this installation method of using long adjustable poles. The side panels on this are for Advent, and they change seasonally. And they don't need anything like a scissor lift or a scaffolding, tall ladder. They want to use, they wanted to use something very simple. Uh, and quick. So Stan Shetler designed this way. Um, this is a mater installation for uh, Princeton Academy of the Sacred Heart, and it's a t uh, suspended from a cable. If you look in the upper corners, follow the center panel out to each side, there's a cable drilled into the stone on either side and it's tightened and the paintings are suspended from that. Um, these are probably about a foot from the wall so they can move in space. This is uh, St. Thomas More in Glendale, Arizona, some of the Stations of the Cross. These are suspended from a soffit. So there's space between the, the dropped ceiling there and the back wall and it goes up to windows. So these paintings are suspended from that. Uh, the left one is uh, Jesus Meets His Mother. 
and the center panel, Simon of Cyrene Helps. And the one on the right is Veronica Wipes the Tears of Jesus. And this is another view of St. Thomas More. And in, in this, uh, the one on the right is split. It's the station for when Jesus dies on the cross. And that one seemed to require a little more of me. I went to a spiritual support group and took that. And the painting I held up, stood on a chair, and tore the center to symbolize the division, the division being removed between us and the holy spaces. This is Our Lady of Mercy in Potomac, Maryland, and they ordered the different seasons. This is uh, Epiphany or Ordinary Time. There's at the top, the string, the rod goes up and then comes, the uh, wire goes up and then comes back down. So they can be lowered and changed seasonally, which is another convenient way to change the, the pieces. And again, something, uh, this is more stationary. This is the hotel, boutique hotel in Romania. Curtain rods are used in this one. They hold the piece six inches out from the wall and then have a rod across with a, a finial on either end. Now we're gonna get a little more kinetic. So here is a Good Shepherd Catholic community with the rod suspending out from the center beam. It allows for more movement. And also the split painting does the same. And a gonfalon for Princeton or a processional piece. They were the first ones to introduce me to this format and uh, they can carry it, it flows back. And I like the cutout in the center that it doesn't blow in your face. Uh, this is for St. Mary's Notre Dame in South Bend, and they wanted a little bit more uh, space of the painting instead of the cutout so they could be used on the stage for their baccalaureate. The curve here is to express the South, the South Bend in the St. Joe River there in um, South Bend, Indiana. This one is a video. Um, and can show just a, how a stationary piece can offer a little bit more um, movement, a lightness. This is at Georgian Court University. And getting more kinetic, St. James Cathedral took theirs outside in this video. So they started their procession outside <clears throat> and then they took it inside. Which brings us to processional kites. Um, I have, this is the Princeton University Chapel and processional kites Rather than using the wind, you can, they can be pulled through space on the end of an 18-foot pole, which brings us to Princeton University. So prior to this presentation, just in September, Princeton decided to bring pieces up from their crypt and storage from 1997. In 1997, I created um, two 25-foot long pieces for the celebration of the 250th anniversary of the university. And to install these takes a little bit uh, more of a pathway, so it'll be fun to be able to show you this. Uh, these two gentlemen are preparing to get everything together. So they sewed them onto uh, a rod at the top. This is a detail of the work. And the paintings laying across 
the uh, benches. So in order to get this long piece to hang from the ceiling, um, it has to go up a narrow uh, shaft in the back of the university chapel, which is, it turns, it's made of stone, there's not much space. So we picked the painting up all along one side and held it straight up and carried it up through that little narrow passageway to the Triforium, where there's a pulley system that goes from one side to the other in the Triforium. And the paintings had to go through these archways. Over the light cans. And we used sheets so that they didn't get dusty. And then there was a third uh, person across the way who was pulling on the wire so that it could be pulled across. and then drop down. So this is a view through one of the Triforium windows of these pieces hanging. So they join six other pieces which are hanging in the chapel. And those six pieces went up in 2001 um, when the chapel was rededicated. And those six pieces came down from light cans. So all the way above the arches, when you stand up there, the arches are reversed. So you walk down the center and down through the light cans, these paintings were dropped and a long chain was dropped to the floor, the paintings attached and then pulled back up. So that was how to attach the, the, uh, the centerpieces there. This is a view of one of the 25 foot pieces installed. This section, this, um, these two pieces are called threshold, and they have a pattern at the top that then dissolves into more of an all over pattern at the bottom, kind of combining something more organized in patterns and something more loosely organized. It's like entropy. There's this uh, respiration between structure and uh, space. This is the set together, the center uh, six. That installation is called Infusion. And the outer two 25 foot pieces are the threshold pieces. The next video kind of shows everything together along with four processional kites. It's the recessional uh, video from the uh, opening exercises in September. And now it's time for a break. That was a lot. <laughs> and yes, I do like my breaks. Um, and I do like ice cream and coffee. So now I'm going to tell you a little bit more about the design process for me. Uh, but first, there are people who don't uh, want the silk, they want my designs, but they like something a little bit more of a hardscaping. So my work can be fused between two pieces of glass or it can be hand painted on glass. This is a detail from a client who sent it to me uh, showing how the, the light goes through onto the wall. So speaking of reflection, so now reflection. I'm going to start with a watercolor. This is a design for a company in New York uh, called Inferential Focus, and they gather information, they synthesize it together, and then present to uh, Fortune 500 companies to, um, help, to help them make decisions. And when I looked at this, I realized it's also something about the creative process. 
Um, the title of this piece is called Synthesis, by the way. When I told the client the title, he said, oh, great. Um, this is Charles Hess. He said, I like that. And I said, no, 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 the by the way isn't supposed to be there. And he said, no, I like it. Leave it. So the title was Synthesis, by the way. So the point is sometimes the title, the work, it's a bit of a collaborative process. And for me to center, that center piece, and this drawing is important, uh, to, to find the space of prayer, to listen, to reach outward, remember the conversations from the client, to imagine myself in the space, or perhaps even go to the space again and visit it, uh, and, and listen as deeply as I can. The process is a mystery, really. Um, though I do my exploration, um, it's still a mystery. The next images are on paper, canvas and silk, and will kind of be that mini story, perhaps, of how this unfolds. Uh, the ordinary time is important to me. This is an image uh, on silk of ordinary time, and I ground myself in just the ordinary things of the day, like chopping vegetables, being outside, uh, conversations, and oftentimes that's where those divine whispers surprise me. This is an oil painting. It's a detail of it. It's called Birth of Seraphim. And one thing I started doing uh, was asking someone in the congregation or someone in my church, I've also asked to pray for me while I'm designing. And I find just having that partnership is very supportive. This is a drawing um, of a figure. The pose is from Symblet's Anatomy for Artists. And the title is Seed. So as the, the ideas start to come for a project, I imagine almost myself being a seed or the idea being a seed. Like what does it, what does it feel like to listen for the natural process to unfold naturally and to trust that? So the, the pattern around the figure is, um, is a sacred geometry pattern called seed, the, the seed of life. The other thing um, I listen to uh, is the material, the brushes, the watercolor, the paint, the colors. If what, what does the material want to say to me? What, what do the colors want to say? What are they reaching for? How do they want to move? What, do the, what gestures are coming out? It's, it's a little bit of a dance in this listening process. I often find part of this process involves, uh, this is an oil painting, uh, it involves during the space of prayer an opening or a liberation of my heart where I find there's joy, there's sorrow, but it's an open space through which uh, more can happen once my heart is open. And what wants to take flight? You know, even on a cloudy day, what, what ideas start to come up? What wants to fly? And where does it want to go? Where do, where do the ideas want to go? And how far out, how far do I need to reach? to bring this idea in or to allow the idea to exist and start to grow on its own. I really appreciate the Hubble telescope images um, very much. They seem to bring perspective to me and inspire me. And I also 
have my own time of invocations asking for divine guidance. Um, these are three details from the Jacob's Ladder mobile from earlier. Um, the dream of Jacob's Ladder when the angels are ascending and descending. And, and what does an angel even look like? What is that? What is something that is uh, almost indescribable? It is indescribable by words, images, um, and yet the attempt, that one slice of, of an attempt to describe something other than this three-dimensional world. And what gold boils to the top of the dross? What do I see boiling to the top? What's starting to show itself? These are the two drawings for the center panels for New Brunswick Theological Seminary when they were done. And there's a moment I find in my drawings when the drawing gains its own voice and it says, stop, I'm done. It takes on its own life in a way. For these, that happened prior to uh, me looking at them and thinking, okay, I've done this twice. This is my third take. I think it's another draft. So once I let go and decided it was a draft and continued working, continued putting the marks down, suddenly there it was. So there's a uh, letting go in the process of this mystery to listening for the right image. And I find um, fuel, one of my main fuels for this creative process is music. And I had the opportunity uh, a week ago to be in the Princeton University Chapel as evening was setting in and the light was going down and Ruth Cunningham was performing a sound healing uh, event. She, with her ethereal voice, harp, so many different ways she created this ethereal space in the Princeton University Chapel. And the windows themselves, as the light went down, turned into these line drawings almost and it's the kind of the music just inspires and sparks ideas for me the title of this painting on silk uh, which i created for my own uh, meditation is light from darkness penna rose from the princeton chapel is the choir uh, director she directs princeton music and she's been a real inspirational inspiration to me in the things that she tells her choir. So uh, one of the main things that she says when she's standing in front of her choir, they're preparing to sing, she says, sing like your life depends on it. Sing into the stone of the chapel so that it can join the voices of those who came before and be released to join those who sing here in the future. This is a detail from the uh, seminary project. And I just want to say I'm, I'm grateful to be part of this community of past and present and future artists who foster sacred space. Thank you. Thanks so much, Juanita. Um, at this point, we will open this up to mm -hmm. Uh, members and attendees to ask questions. Uh, let me start out um, with a few questions I have in my mind while we're waiting for people to, to enter their own questions. Um, so you work in a variety of different medium. Do you blend um, any of your silk or your other um, media that you use with other artists? I mean, have you have you worked, it looks like you work collaboratively with uh, building owners and, and potentially, mm -hmm. you know, designing buildings or consultants, but um, do you have collaboration then with other artists where your works are, are kind of uh, um, integrated into other materials or other pieces of artwork? 
Um, I used to do more of that. I really love doing that. I mean, I do work with a kite artist to do the kites, Martin Blay, and he did the sewing and the structure of it. I designed it and then um, he did the, the building. Um, I've worked with uh, fashion designers actually to create more couture pieces and that was fun. Um, I'm very open to do to doing collaboration, so I hope uh, anyone's listening who wants to collaborate, let me know. <laughs> but and then, it, and, and then it looks like um, so now you and I don't know if this was a, a procession from painting to silk to now glass and other material. Mm -hmm. um, are those the primary materials that you use? Uh, yes, and the glass um, was done in conjunction with meltdown glass. So, so thank you for mentioning that. Um, the glass itself, uh, the textured glass, was created at meltdown. So I sent my drawings to them, and they created uh, the glass to have texture that flowed with the same design um, that I sent. And then I flew out there and painted on glass. So that was a collaboration in that way. Great. So we have a question from Gilbert. I think you know Gilbert uh, mm -hmm. from ACLS asking, Hi, Gilbert. Uh, first saying wonderful presentation. And he has a question Thank about you. the best type of light to show off your mm -hmm. work, especially in the pieces hanging in the middle of the mm -hmm. large name, so like Princeton. Um, mm -hmm. I know um, when we did our practice run of this webinar, you talked about the light uh, on those pieces that were backlit, I think they were the Stations of the Cross. Um, right. So I'm sure light is important for how your work is engaged. Mm -hmm. Thank you. The backlighting is actually quite exciting because the pieces glow. The important thing is to avoid ultraviolet light, so direct sun uh, wouldn't work. But um, you can use filters on the lights to filter filter out ultraviolet, so spots. Um, Princeton has used used spots, but their huge pieces in the Triforium, honestly, are lit by ambient light from the lights on either side, the, the windows, the huge windows, and also light, they have suspended chandeliers, which then um, uh, light from the sides. They also have light cans in the ceiling that come down. Uh, right above where the threshold pieces are, they have spots which can be shined on uh, work as well. But, but honestly, um, ambient light is probably the best rather than some kind of direct, especially you don't want ultraviolet. So uh, something that's safe for the work is important. And so then, um, do you do you have a process that you're able to do work that is then outside or in ultraviolet light? Have you had an opportunity to do that yet, or figure that? I'm I'm just asking because I know a lot of churches mm -hmm. that hang uh, mm -hmm. streamers or banners outside, and mm -hmm. usually mm -hmm. the, the material has to be quite uh, durable in a different way and and waterproof. Mm -hmm. And I'm mm -hmm. just curious if you've done that. So my work has been used for outdoor processionals by Princeton, St. James Cathedral, um, and it can be, those were on silk, but it can be translated and printed um, with durable things outside using a printer. So that's how that would be done. I'm not gonna handle the materials needed for outdoor work, but it can be done. Okay. Mm -hmm. Great. Um, so, uh, that also raised a question in my mind about cleaning. Um, I mean, I would guess that the seasonal pieces that maybe are used less often um, don't need cleaning because they're probably stored adequately by most clients. But they're the pieces like, um, and you mentioned the in Princeton the 2001 pieces. Um, if those are up all the time, which I'm assuming they are. Uh, that's a pretty long length of time, and is there ongoing maintenance that has to be that they have to be cared for in a certain way? Right, um, they have been there since 2001, and we talked about that. They're holding up extremely well. Part of it is the paintings move; they don't really attract dirt or dust, except for maybe right along the top. Uh, they took them down one time. 
just to kind of you know make sure everything's straightened because they do move around quite a lot so they just reorganized them and put them back up they didn't need cleaning should pieces need cleaning um, just to reiterate the process involves steaming them hot for one hour plunging them into a sink of cold water cold water and then increasing the heat until it's hot and they run clear so they can be hand washed but i recommend that uh, i'm hired to do that they can also be dry cleaned i would recommend a company that uh, handles very fine stage set uh, materials so they you know can handle something that large uh, that's important but really, because of the mo motion of the piece, they don't really collect dust. Mm -hmm. And and I'm thinking, you know, most of the applications look vertical. Um, right. So so I have seen uh, uh, fabric art that that has a horizontal dimension to it, and in those cases, I would think there would be some even more need for periodic cleaning because things could um, mm -hmm. accumulate on top of them. Um, I'm also wondering about, and, and this is probably a silly question given our last conversation, but the duration of your pieces, I mean, these are essentially um, long-term, potentially long-term um, pieces of art that could be used, I mean, if stored correctly, or even in the space. I mean, 20 years is a long period of time for works of art. Mm -hmm. I would guess that the duration is quite a bit longer than that. Yes, and um, one of my early exhibits was at the Cathedral of St. John the Divine, and they have a textile uh, specialist right there. And I talked to some people there, and you know, silks and fabrics have been around for thousands of years. You know, they just need to be cared for very carefully and properly. And that's why I mentioned, you know, to be uh, gentle with them with the ultraviolet light. So really, it is nice to have seasonal pieces that change. That's helpful. Um, but cleaning them um, can be done, you know, and the dyes that I use are permanent and I wash them out. So. So we have another question about um, mm -hmm. what type of recommendation you have then for storage of, of the banners that you do, um, or at least what you've seen uh, owners at churches, uh, mm -hmm. what methods you've used, you've seen used and what, what you think works the best. Uh, well, the, the Princeton pieces, they have a very long, wide um, uh, tube. And the large pieces are rolled, but as people roll them, I recommend adding sheets, you know, of paper, archival paper, so that it keeps it um, smooth. And then uh, it's kept in a climate control room. The kites are in a room, a climate control room, open uh, and sleeved. Uh, I've also seen long tubes uh, and again covered with something archival uh, up on a pedestal kind of where you might keep your liturgical uh, vestments or your paraments and things and the paintings can be looped back and forth over that kind of um, a tube or bar. I'm about to see a new installation way, uh, installation uh, method and also storage method at 8th Street Mennonite Church. Apparently Stan Shetler, who designed the installation poles, also designed in behind their organ, something similar to what I was describing, but for all the, the work. Okay, so there, and, and mm -hmm. behind the organ, then are those like permanently hung, but not in view, is that? kind of right 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 mm -hmm. over over a bar but I recommend the bar be really wide so that there's no crease then you don't have any ironing when you take them back out okay um, so uh, just kind of uh, switching direction from the art itself I'm I'm kind of curious about the time frame um, and I and I realize smaller pieces may move more quickly than than larger installations. I mean, when you have six panels for a whole season of a church year, that's probably a little mm -hmm. bit more um, involved. 
but what's a general time frame? So like when a when a when somebody first contacts you and you get started on design, you know, what what length of time is pretty typical for that? And and then during fabrication and then installation, if we can just understand a little bit about the timeline. I'd say generally a half a year to a year. Uh, from initial contact to ideas to fundraising, you know, that can go anywhere from uh, a year to years. But once designs start, um, depending on the size, scope, and scale of the project, it can be a half year to a year. Okay. And then, um, any, so um, I'm always amazed uh, as an architect when, when we design buildings and they are either not constructed the way that we um, have initially designed them or or they need to be modified. Maybe that's a better way to put it during the construction. Um, I'm, I'm just curious about uh, what you encounter during installations that um, uh, it has either changed how you think about your work or, um, or, or last minute sorts of things that either owners maybe um, or architects that you're working with make changes that you you mentioned with the Jacob's Ladder that that initially it was supposed to be someplace else and right. I don't you know hopefully you didn't find that out the day of the installation but I I'm always amazed at how you have to be a little uh, quick on your feet um, when you're mm -hmm. when you're seeing things come to fruition with installations. Well, two things, the kinetic work is where that really comes into play. Um, the Jacobs ladder pieces were installed where I originally uh, designed them to be installed. When I went back for the second commission for the seminary is when I noticed it had been moved. So they moved the entire installation without me present. Okay. So when I walked in, I was like, <laughs> what? Um, and it's wonderful where it is actually in, in the main entryway and it interacts with that uh, wooden wall um, of, of this gorgeous, gorgeous, you know, textured uh, staircase. So it was designed to be in an area that was all white and then moved to an area with this amber, lovely amber wooden wall, which was nice actually. I enjoyed seeing that. Um, most recently when we were installing the Princeton 25 foot pieces, Originally, they were designed to be stationary and flat, uh, just hang straight, perpendicular to the side walls. And I noticed they were putting swivels on them. They said, oh, yes, we want them to turn. We really want them to turn. And I thought, I hope this works. I don't know if it's going to work or not. Um, and once all was said and done, it was really, really amazing to watch how everything interacted because the other pieces swivel and turn. And I was most surprised when I went in uh, later and noticed one of them, it appeared, had disappeared, it had dropped. And I was very concerned about this until I stood for just a little longer and it turned and came into view, which well, I found exciting. I thought, this, this is amazing. I thought I always wanted the larger pieces to be stationary and now I don't know. And I'm more interested in mobiles and what can be done with that element of, uh, of the kinetic. So we have another question from uh, Marilyn Morgan, Sister Marilyn, um, asking about how you educate clients about the cost of the work, and um, and, and and are they um, generally surprised? Are they, you know, do they uh, are they not surprised about potential cost, and just how you engage um, that conversation with your clients? Mm -hmm. I think it's really important upfront to talk about the process, uh, that the work is all hand painted uh, by, my, by me and that I mix all the dye and we have conversations. There's a lot more conversation prior to stating the price, honestly. I think that's where uh, the important work happens of connecting to their vision and what needs to be designed and then also talking about the technical aspect of it and what's required and at that point, I feel that when I quote my price, I really haven't had, you know, people say it shouldn't be that way. Um, it might be that it's not within their budget. And then there are sometimes ways to work within the budget. There are times no. 
uh, but I feel the educational process of what I was just um, showing here of the handwork involved. It's not a design that's just, go, I don't go out and get it printed. It's all, it flows, it's unique, it's theirs, it's one off, it's one of a kind, specifically for the space. That's kind of related to, um, I'll, I'll have to confess, um, you see the beauty of your work and, I, and I've seen it over the years and it, and you make, the beauty of it makes it look so easy and and seeing this presentation and seeing the process and what you go through um that's no longer a perception for me and i think that's probably um, the reason why that you would want to educate an owner about process because i think it looks easy right many things mm -hmm. that are beautiful paintings buildings things like that everyone um it, it the the person the artist can make the craft look so um fluid and and you kind of presume that it's easy and in fact it it actually isn't i mean even beyond the creation mm -hmm. fabrication very complicated i think it's important to talk also about the design process and the amount of of quiet the meditation the conversation um it's not production work which is what often our uh, culture values, but I feel that that is what is something that that element of uh, the art design process for all of us is what adds um, the deeper places that it can go for the client. So um, I, I have been fascinated by the kites, um, and 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 partly because it's a little more unusual. Um, maybe not in in you know large liturgical settings, but for the for the average parish, um, I, I don't know. In my whole experience, I've ever seen kites before used in worship. I absolutely think they're phenomenal. When did when did you first have the opportunity of doing that, or how did that all come about? They're awfully fun. <laughs> um, <laughs> The, the first opportunity was um, for the Pastoral Musicians Conference. There was one of their meetings in Washington, D.C. And at that point, I was doing work for uh, Our Lady of Mercy in Potomac. And uh, Tom Staley was doing the worship leading and some things and organizing for the conference. And I was interested in making kites and I was talking about this and describing what I wanted to do. And he said, I think that we should have you make them. Um, so I made kites for that uh, event. And then when I started working with Princeton, I took a kite and showed them and they ordered um, four of them and it just went from there. <laughs> so, I mean, had you, I'm just kind of curious about this. Had you the seen idea. that someplace before? I think I, so, I think yeah. I, something similar in like Chinese cultures. So um, at the Cathedral of St. John the Divine at their blessing of the animals, there was a gentleman who had this long white uh, carp kite and it was all white and very simple. And I saw that and I thought, I, I really want to paint on that. <laughs> so I started to work on designs and did research and found an art of, a kite engineer who could do the building so i sent him designs and then we collaborated great so um i have been so fascinated that i have lost track of time and we are like oh. right at <laughs> one o'clock thank oh. you so much